Hayes checked the status of the fuel cells and found that two of them were dead. Mission rules forbade entering lunar orbit unless all fuel cells were operational. In the minutes after the accident, there were several unusual readings, showing that Tank 2 was empty and Tank 1's pressure slowly falling, that the computer on the spacecraft had reset and that the high-gain antenna was not working. Liebergott initially missed the worrying signs from Tank 2 following the stir, as he was focusing on Tank 1, believing that its reading would be a good guide to what was present in Tank 2, so did controllers supporting him in the back room. Since the fuel cells needed oxygen to operate, when oxygen Tank 1 ran dry, the remaining fuel cell would shut down, meaning the CSM's only significant sources of power and oxygen would be the CM's batteries and its oxygen surge tank. These would be needed for the final hours of the mission, but the remaining fuel cell, already starved for oxygen, was drawing from the surge tank. Kranz ordered the surge tank isolated, saving its oxygen, but this meant that the remaining fuel cell would die within two hours, as the oxygen in tank 1 was consumed or leaked away. The mission's goal became simply getting the astronauts back to Earth alive. The lunar module had charged batteries and full oxygen tanks for use on the lunar surface, so Kranz directed that the astronauts power up the LM and use it as a lifeboat, a scenario anticipated but considered unlikely. Procedures for using the LM in this way had been developed by LM flight controllers after a training simulation for Apollo 10 in which the LM was needed for survival, but could not be powered up in time. Had Apollo 13's accident occurred on the return voyage, with the LM already jettisoned, the astronauts would have died, as they would have following an explosion in lunar orbit, including one while Lovell and Hayes walked on the moon. Apollo 13 was on the hybrid trajectory which was to take it to Fra Mauro, it now needed to be brought back to a free return. The LM's descent propulsion system, although not as powerful as the SPS, could do this, but new software for Mission Control's computers needed to be written by technicians as it had never been contemplated that the CSM-LM spacecraft would have to be maneuvered from the LM. As the CM was being shut down, Lovell copied down its guidance system's orientation. Information and performed hand calculations to transfer it to the LM's guidance system, which had been turned off, at his request Mission Control checked his figures. 49 The DPS burn of 34.23 seconds took Apollo 13 back to a free return trajectory. The change would get Apollo 13 back to Earth in about four days' time, though with splashdown in the Indian Ocean, where NASA had few recovery forces. After a meeting involving NASA officials and engineers, the senior individual present, Manned Spaceflight Center Director Robert R. Gilruth, decided on a burn using the DPS, that would save 12 hours and land Apollo 13 in the Pacific. At Paracynthian, Apollo 13 set the record, which still stands, for the highest absolute altitude attained by a crewed spacecraft, 400,171 kilometers from Earth at 7.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, April 14. Note 4. While preparing for the burn the crew was told that the SIVB had impacted the moon as planned, leading Lovell to quip, well, at least something worked on this flight. Kranz's white team of mission controllers, who had spent most of their time supporting other teams and developing the procedures urgently needed to get the astronauts home, took their consoles for the PC-2 procedure. Normally, the accuracy of such a burn could be assured by checking the alignment level had transferred to the LM's computer against the position of one of the star's astronauts used for navigation, but the light glinting off the many pieces of debris accompanying the spacecraft made that impractical. The astronauts used the one star available whose position could not be obscured, the sun. The crew then shut down most LM systems to conserve consumables. The LM carried enough oxygen, but that still left the problem of removing carbon dioxide, which was absorbed by canisters of lithium hydroxide pellets. The LM's stock of canisters, meant to accommodate two astronauts for 45 hours on the moon, was not enough to support three astronauts for the return journey to Earth. The CM had enough canisters, but they were of a different shape and size than the LM's, hence unable to be used in the LM's equipment. The CSM's electricity came from fuel cells that produced water as a byproduct, but the LM was powered by silver-zinc batteries which did not, so both electrical power and water would be critical. LM power consumption was reduced to the lowest level possible, Swigert was able to fill some drinking bags with water from the CM's water tap, but even assuming rationing of personal consumption, Hayes initially calculated they would run out of water for cooling about five hours before re-entry. This seemed acceptable because the systems of Apollo 11's LM, once jettisoned in lunar orbit, had continued to operate for seven to eight hours even with the water cut off. In the end, Apollo 13 returned to Earth with 12.8 kilograms of water remaining. The crew's ration was 0.2 liters of water per person per day, 
The three astronauts lost a total of 14 kilograms among them, and Hayes developed a urinary tract infection. All three astronauts were cold, especially Swigert, who had got his feet wet while filling the water bags and had no lunar overshoes. Water condensed on the walls, though any condensation that may have been behind equipment panels caused no problems, partly because of the extensive electrical insulation improvements instituted after the Apollo 1 fire. Flight controller John Aaron, along with Mattingly and several engineers and designers, devised a procedure for powering up the command module from full shutdown, something never intended to be done in flight, much less under Apollo 13's severe power and time constraints. The astronauts implemented the procedure without apparent difficulty. Kranz later credited all three astronauts having been test pilots, accustomed to having to work in critical situations with their lives on the line, for their survival. Having the LM's computer running enabled Lovell to perform a navigational sighting and calibrate the LM's IMU. With the lunar module's computer aware of its location and orientation, the command module's computer was later calibrated in a reverse of the normal procedures used to set up the LM, shaving steps from the restart process and increasing the accuracy of the PGNCS controlled re-entry. As the LM's guidance system had been shut down following the PC-2 burn, the crew was told to use the line between night and day on the Earth to guide them, a technique used on NASA's Earth orbit missions but never on the way back from the Moon. Yet another burn was needed at 137 to 40, 13, using the LM's reaction control system thrusters, for 21.5 seconds. The normal procedure, in lunar orbit, was to release the LM and then use the service module's RCS to pull the CSM away, but by T, 